All right, we're back for part two of our reaction quotient discussion. And I would say that this is probably the situation that you're gonna see the most on the exam. Um, and it's this idea of something called Le Chatelier's Principle. And Le Chatelier's Principle is more of a conceptual idea, but it applies the reaction quotient in a way that helps explain some interesting things that happen in chemical reactions. So. Le Chatelier's principle states that if a system at equilibrium is disturbed by changing the conditions, so we're at equilibrium, and then you do something to change the conditions, the position of the equilibrium will shift to counteract that change and reestablish equilibrium. So you can kind of think about it, think about it like either like a balance board that you're trying to stand on, or think about like a seesaw or a teeter-totter. And when you're at equilibrium, okay, you are, if you're on a teeter-totter, you are flat on that teeter-totter. So you've got perfect balance on both sides. The amount isn't important, but the rate that they're exchanging is different or is equal. So Le Chatelier's principle says, I've got this beautiful equilibrium position that I'm currently in. And then I'm going to do something whether it's take something away or alter the conditions to disturb that beautiful balance equilibrium that we have going on. And the idea behind Le Chatelier's principle is that because equilibrium is this dynamic situation, you can expect your reaction to counteract whatever change you put into the system to get back to equilibrium. So it's a change that you cause, but then the idea that your reaction can kind of naturally settle back down. So if you think about standing on like a balance board or something like that, you are perfectly level. Someone kind of pushes you off and throws you off balance and then you reestablish yourself. That's the Chatelier's principle in my mind. So it's a change and then a counteracting of that change to get back to equilibrium. Now, things that can affect it are concentration of reactants. So you can, or product, I should say. So it could be concentration of your reactant or product, anything you put in there. Temperature, so we could adjust the temperature of the system. We could also adjust the pressure of the system, and we're gonna kinda take a look at all of those scenarios. However, keep this in mind, if you add an inert gas, a pure solid, and a pure liquid, it does not affect the equilibrium. So the reason why an inert gas doesn't affect it is because it is inert and doesn't react, so that's pretty simple. But remember, pure solids and pure liquids don't appear in our equilibrium expression, so those are not going to affect it at all when we talk about our equilibrium and this principle. So that's kind of completely ignored. So the real only way that we can do this is by taking a look at some examples. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a look at the reaction of methane, which is CH4 and H2S, hydrogen sulfide, getting together and making CS2 and four hydrogens. And so we are going to assume our reaction is at that perfect balanced equilibrium. And then we're gonna go through four different changes and adjust them. So you're going to decrease the concentration of the dihydrogen sulfide, increase the concentration of the methane, we're gonna increase the pressure on the system. And then I believe it says we're going to increase the temperature. Let me double check that. Yep, increase the temperature of the system. So kind of all the things that we talked about. What we will take a look at is how reaction quotient ties into that and how they like you to kind of explain that, what a graph of this would look like and how that shift is going to occur. So we will get into our examples right away because honestly, that's the best way to do this. Okay, so our first question is what would happen to the equilibrium if I decrease the concentration of the dihydrogen sulfide. So like I said, we're kind of at perfect equilibrium here. We are perfectly balanced, okay? And then what we need to do is think about if I decrease the concentration of the dihydrogen sulfide, think about this like our perfectly balanced situation. All of a sudden, I am light on my reactant side because I didn't have as much H2S as I had previously had when I was at equilibrium. So my change is that all of a sudden I'm light on my reactant side. To counteract that, and this is the heart of the principle, my reaction is going to shift in the reverse direction and make more reactant 
to slowly reestablish equilibrium, okay? There'll be a little bit of the forward reaction, but it will be heavy in the reverse reaction. So how do we prove that? How do we discuss that? What does that look like? Well, this is where our reaction quotient is going to be super helpful in helping us explain why this happens. So if you think about it, we're at equilibrium, and I'm going to write down my equilibrium expression here. So it's going to be concentration of CS2 times the concentration of H2 to the fourth power divided by concentration of CH4 times H2S squared. So that's my normal reaction quotient. It's the same for every single step that we go through. So imagine that we are at equilibrium and this combination here is perfect and equals our K value that we've talked about. If I decrease my concentration of dihydrogen sulfide, I'm gonna make this concentration go down. What this does is it makes a smaller number in my denominator and the same number in my numerator. So the, the concentrations, the quantities of these guys don't change, but all of a sudden I have a smaller number here. And what ends up happening is that's going to increase my Q value. So my Q now is greater than my equilibrium constant. And we talked about in our previous um, video how if my Q is greater than my K value, it means all of a sudden I'm heavy on products. And so if you think about this as being a balance board here, okay, so here's my balance board. Like I said, if I get rid of some of the H2S, oof, I'm light on reactant and heavy on product. And that has to do with that reaction quotient Q that we talked about. So what's going to happen is that currently we have too much product. So what's gonna, we'll say um, the reaction will favor the reverse process to make more reactant and reestablish equilibrium. So what I need to do is I need to go to my reverse reaction. I've got to kind of head heavily into the reverse direction here, make lots more reactant, get rid of some products so I can reestablish equilibrium and get to the point where I'm equal again. Okay, now how this looks graphically, you very well could see a graph like this on a multiple choice question or an FRQ. I've seen them on there recently. They really like to see these. So I want to let you guys know that the positions of the like height on here, I'm not really concerned about that necessarily at this point. What we're just going to be looking at is the shape. So in terms of the H2S, all of a sudden you're going to see a dramatic drop in its concentration because we took some of the H2S out. But what will happen is after it drops, because it's this dynamic situation, you are going to see a gentle increase in your concentration. Now, you're probably not going to get to a point where you are higher than your original H2S amount, but you will go up. And that's because that forward reaction is slowing down and the reverse reaction is speeding up and we're making more product. If we are looking at this from the side of CS2s, reaction. You will not see the dramatic spike here because we didn't change the amount of the CS2 initially, but what you will see is kind of a gentle decrease in its concentration, and this should flatten out. Sorry about that here. Um, it should flatten out as well, and this is going to go down because the reaction is shifting towards that more reversed reaction, and so we're going to be using this concentration up. Now you'd see the same thing happen in H2, and then CH4s would be not this dramatic drop, but you'd see kind of a gentle rise. So if this was CH4, you would see another gentle rise here, okay? So that's kind of what you're seeing. Now, in theory, you could have to pay attention to the drops. So if we're talking about like H2, H2s would drop faster because it's got a coefficient of four on there. Now, I'm not saying they're gonna make you look at every single one of those, but it's possible that you could have to take a look at a graph like this and describe what's gonna happen. So that's what we're doing. All right, for B, 
we are going to increase the concentration of the methane here. Now, anytime we do any manipulation with concentrations, I think you need to talk about the Q value here um, to kind of justify the change that you're talking about here. So in this case, we are going to increase our concentration of CH4. So if you think about what's going on in our Q value, we have the same number on top, we have a larger number on the bottom than we did when we were at equilibrium. So if you think about this like a teeter-totter, okay, it's like going like this. All of a sudden I've got more stuff here. So what that does is it means that right now when I make that change, I'm going to be heavy on reactant and a little light on product. And if you think about the math of the Q value, you are going to have a Q value that's going down from where your K value was. So in this case, Q is going to be less than K, and what will have to happen is I'm going to have to head heavy in the product direction to get back to equilibrium. So what we would say as far as establishing equilibrium in this case is that we'll say that the reaction favors the forward direction and will make more product to reestablish equilibrium. Okay, so we've got the opposite thing going on here. So because we have more reactant this time, it's gonna go up. Now, if you think about our graph, I'm not gonna go through every single species, but if we look at CH4's graph, in this case, CH4 is gonna see a big spike because we add some more in. And then because it's shifting, in that forward direction, it's going to see a drop that'll look kind of like this. So you'll see a big spike. It means I'm injecting CH4 into the system. And then initially it's really high and it will drop as the reaction reestablishes. On the opposite side of things, CS2 here, CS2 is going to have not a big spike at all, but also you'll see a gradual trending upwards because it goes in that forward direction. So when we talk about concentration changes, that's what you'll see. You'll either see big spikes or big drops and then changes accordingly. Um, I guess I would like to talk about H2S a little bit here. H2S, because it's a reactant, it's not going to have the big spike because you didn't add any more, but it will kind of taper off here and then go down a little bit as well. Okay, so those are your concentration changes. Now, if we talk about pressure changes on a system, that affects the amount of gas particles you have more than anything else. And we could do a partial pressure calculation, but I don't really think that's necessary. Um, what we just need to talk about is generally what is going on with um, the moles of gas, because that's honestly the biggest driver. So on this side, we have three moles of gas. And on our product side, we have five moles of gas. So what is going to happen is if you think about your container, and I'm about to draw not a great picture, but that's okay. I don't want to hear your judgment. <laughs> I don't have all the colors, so. Let's see, maybe I can do that. All right. So on our reactant side, we have CH4 and H2S, and on our product side, we have CS2. And then four H's. Okay, so when we think about our equilibrium, it, if we start with all reactants, we'd have three moles of stuff, assuming we put that in there. And then when we make stuff, we're going to make five moles of gas. So whatever that combination is at equilibrium, you know, if we head more towards the reactant side, we'll get fewer moles of gas. If we head more towards the product side, we'll get more moles of gas. So when you think about pressure on a system, if I increase the pressure here, if you think about who has more particles floating around, I'm gonna have a bigger issue and more stress happening on the side with more moles of gas than I do on the side with fewer moles of gas because there's just literally more moles in, in here to have an overall like higher effect on it. So this is gonna be 
a bigger change here than it would be on my React inside. So what will happen is in this case, if I make my pressure go up, and this is for all things, if I increase the pressure by making my container smaller, what will happen is my reaction always shifts to the side with fewer moles of gas. Okay, so if I increase it, it's going to shift to the side with fewer moles of gas. If I decrease the pressure, your reaction is going to shift to the side with more moles of gas. Okay, so that's what we're going to see. So in this case, if we're increasing the pressure in the system, our reaction is going to shift to the left-hand side here, to the reactant side. It will increase the rate of production of the reverse reaction so that I have fewer moles of gas so it can mitigate that stress. Now, what that looks like on a graph here would be if this is, let's say, CS2 here to start off with a product, you will see a big spike because we are increasing the pressure. So all of a sudden it's going to be like, oh, we have you know more stuff because it's more concentrated. But because we're going to shift to the side with um, less moles of gas here, the products or the reactant side, you're going to see a drop in the concentration of the CS2. On the opposite side of things, if I take a look at H2S, this is where you'll see the difference. You'll see a big spike right here too because the change that you're making affects everything in the equilibrium system. But what's going to happen to the H2S is now it is going to go up in its concentration because it's shifting to the reactant side. So moles of gas are a little bit different. And then our last change that we're going to talk about is um, the temperature. And it looks like I forgot to add this on here, but our our enthalpy change is negative 357 kilojoules on here. So when you think about an enthalpy change, they might give it to you as a number, they might give it to you as some general information. When you think about that enthalpy change, you've got to think about what side the heat belongs on. So a negative enthalpy change means that I have heat as a product because it's exothermic. So if I have an exothermic process, then we just treat heat like any other reactant or product. There's no Q value to really look at here, so we just need to understand the idea. So if you think about heat as a product, if I increase the temperature, that is like increasing the amount of heat. Like I said, it's not a Q issue necessarily, it's just the concept. So I've increased the amount of heat, which means that I've effectively added more product. So what's going to happen is that to get back to equilibrium, my reaction is going to shift in the reverse direction to get back there. Now, if I would cool it down, my reaction would kind of tip the other direction where I'd have more focus on my reactant side and it would increase this way. The idea is that if I take this heat out and I pull it out of the system, then it creates essentially more, not space, but kind of more ability for these to turn in if I can mitigate the heat because the heat affects the equilibrium. If I add more heat in here to something that already is producing heat, it's gonna wanna go in this direction because it's gonna be endothermic in the reverse direction and it'll get rid of some of that heat. So it's kind of the general idea behind it. So in this case, what's gonna happen is my reaction will um, favor the reverse process to mitigate the additional heat. So in this case, you're gonna see the concentration of these two go up and the concentration of these two go down. Graph-wise, you don't get any dramatic spike at all. So based on our shift, our CS2, we talked about how it's gonna go down. You are just gonna see a gradual drop here. My H2S's concentration is just gonna be a gradual rise. So you will be sometimes seeing different changes where you'll see, oh, CS2 is going down. Then you see a big spike and it goes down like this you will need to be able to understand what those different, I guess, changes are caused by and to kind of predict those as well. So we will definitely go over some more practice like this in class, but this is just kind of a general idea. So if you have any questions, please get them cleared up. Otherwise, good luck.